All right, line B1, learning task three. This is our third video in it because we're just having so much fun here. And we are gonna go over to our very, very, very last one, which is gonna be our wood chip conveyor that we have over here. We're gonna go through the controls for this one. Ultimately, what needs to happen with this one though is we need to go and have a sequence of events to go and start this thing up. That sequence of events that we are going to need is that if we want this thing to go and start up, we've got heavy weight, right? We've got wood chips. Wet wood chips are actually surprisingly heavy. Uh, and what we're going to want to do is we are going to want to go and start this one first because that way it's going to be starting unloaded. There wouldn't be any chips running on it. So we're going to get this one rotating. Once this one is rotating, then we are going to go and start this one second because it's going to go now be feeding onto that one, but we want to start that thing unloaded. Then last of all, we are going to go and start this one third over here so that we are then going to go and have all the other ones running before we start dumping anything on. And at that point, if we start dumping our wood chips onto this, then, you know, they're going to be falling onto a running belt, which has a much easier time picking them up, carrying them around our, you know, chip yard and taking them out to however we're going to get rid of these things. It looks like a barge at this point. This is going to go and give us sequence. We would never want to go and start in the opposite sequence because if we started in the opposite sequence with this one as number one, it would be dumping chips on here. We'd have a big pile of chips that would be sitting on top of here. And then we would be trying to start this one under load. And there's a good chance that it's either gonna be too much tension for you know, the actual drive, uh, like the belt itself, or for the motor, maybe we wouldn't be able to go and get this thing started, etc. So we never wanna start from the opposite end. We're always gonna go and start with our last one. The last one's gonna be the first one on. It is also gonna be the last one off in a lot of cases. However, this sequence that they're showing us over here is really only giving us load up time. It does not have clean out time. If you're unfamiliar what clean out time is, you gotta go back to video number one from the section here and uh, refer to that. But clean out time would simply mean that if I were to go and hit my stop button to go and shut this thing down, I should have everything running. Even after I hit stop, I should allow everything to run. Because this is me stopping. I'm going to cut off the flow of wood chips at that point. But it's still going to take me 30 seconds. And then this one's going to go and cut out. And then another 30 seconds past that, this one over here would go and cut out. Uh, so it's a total of 60 seconds, you know, between the stop and that being pressed. And then another 30 seconds past that, this one would go and cut out. And you had know, about 90 seconds or something. Just to make sure that each of our... Any sort of load that we have on here is going to get carried through and dumped onto there before this thing goes and shuts down. And then that is going to get carried off of here and cleared off before this one shuts down. And then that's going to get carried off of here and dumped off before that one shuts down. Which means that next time we go to start, we're going to be starting with unloaded belts in a system, which is going to be super, super, super important to us. We do have a couple of other things as well over here. We have got emergency stops that are going to be placed in line with a whole pile of stuff here, as well as we are going to go and have regular stops that are going to be placed in line with a bunch of stuff here as well. The big one to go and note is that uh, they have placed a emergency stops that are supposed to shut down the entire system compared with regular stops, which are supposed to go and give us, you know, just kind of a regular stop as we're going along here. We're going to take a look at how that is inside of our overall drawing. And we are also going to go and shake our heads in disapproval at this drawing itself, uh, you know, in the way that they have done some of the labeling over here. It's just a little bit backwards that we're going to go and see. They've got a pile of stops over here that are labeled as being emergency stops. Those emergency stops are being placed behind my regular stop over here. We just don't want to go and see this. It's not the way stuff is supposed to be. We're supposed to always go and start with our emergency stops upstream, and then we go to less critical. It's not, there's no law or anything. It's just convention that we start with our most critical, and then we're going to get to our least critical as we move, work our way into a system. So it's, yeah, it's really a, not a huge deal, but it's the type of thing that it annoys me and is probably going to go and annoy any good journey person out there who has dealt with this stuff a long time. Before we begin, we're going to go do that thing where we're going to highlight all of the lines that are going to be sitting at rest powered up. So we're going to start by saying this is a normally closed stop. So we are going to be able to go through there. These are all normally closed E stops. We're going to have power up to there and up to there. We are also going to go and have power that is going to go through on this line all the way up to there to my HR. HR is not turned on. We are also going to go and have power that is going to go through these normally closed over here all the way up and power on this red light. This red light is going to be a warning light telling us that the system is shut off. Uh, you might say, well, what's the point of having the red light on there? So in a lot of these industrial places, it's so noisy 
that you can't always verify this thing's on just by sound alone as you're not always going to be in sight so we want to go and have inside of our operator booth something that tells us this thing is currently stopped or currently going right now i see that that thing is going to be currently stopped past that nothing else is going to be energized because i see i've got this really really critical component over here which is going to be my control relay uh, that control relay over there is going to be a master control for everything that is downstream from here. Okay. Oh, sorry. There's one more line. This is connected over here. They're just showing this. That little slash slash by the means uh, by the way means that it's a hop. It's going over top of that thing. Okay. So all of this is up to these points going to be powered. As soon as I go and press my start button, that start button is going to complete the path through here to my CR, which is my control relay, which is then going to go and close its contact and it is going to go and seal in through here. Okay, so that's also going to change every other CR component that I'm going to go and have. I see I've got a CR right over here. That's going to go and instantly go and turn on over there. I'm also going to go and get at the same time as I go and apply power to CR, I'm going to go and apply power to TD1, which is a 30 second time delay. It says there 30S TD1. TD1 has got a number of different components that are going to be associated with it. If you go and take a look, we are going to go and see these over here, TD1, that's going to be associated with that one, as well as I'm going to go and see this over here, which is a normally closed time to open relay over here. The big difference between these is that this one is a timed contact off of there, the TD1 over here, and this one is going to go and be an instant contact off of there. And then there's, sorry, one more off of TD1 as well, which is going to be this one down over here, instant contact off of TD1. So what we have is the instant that we go and apply power to it, all of the TD1s are going to go and operate the instant ones. So these ones here are going to go to being open, which is going to go and shut off my red light. My red light is that the system is at a stop. Right now the system is starting up. It's not running yet, but the system is at a startup. And it's going to go and instantly go and turn on this TD1 over here. This TD1 here should be passing current through to this green light that I'm going to go and have over here. It's not doing anything yet. We're going to come back to that one later on because we do want to, want to talk about that one a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, this one over here is now going to go and have close because it's associated with TD1. TD1 starts a timing sequence at this point. And that timing sequence is going to go and start up a bunch of other stuff. Now, the first thing we're going to note is that CR did turn on. So we do have power that has now been brought through here up to this point, up to this point, up to this point, and up to this point over here. So we've got power waiting at all those points. TD1 is going to do its timing. At the end of its timing, it's going to go and activate. Now, right now, what I'm seeing is that TD1 has gone and... It's a normally closed time to open. So as soon as we powered that up, we had current that went through here instantly because it stayed closed, which is going to go and power my horn relay over here. So I'm going to go ahead have this, which is going to have been powered up. As soon as we powered that coil up, this one starts its timing, but it's not changing to us yet. So it's just going to be powering up. We're going to have a warning horn that is going to be running for the first 30 seconds. At the end of that 30 seconds, what happens is all of my timed TD1s are going to go into change state because they are normally, uh, sorry, it's an on delay type of system. So this one is going to go open, which is going to go and shut down the horn relay. And this one is going to go closed, which is then going to turn on my motor number one. And it's going to go and start up my TD2 timer. So motor one comes on at the end of that uh, five seconds for its time over here, it is going to go and activate its contact and close TD2. Oh, by the way, I should have said this one here was going to go and operate instantly as soon as that one operated there. So our power has advanced a slight, slight bit through here. Going back to this one here, this T1 is going to go in time. Once it hits its five seconds, it closes. That is going to turn on my M2, which is going to go and start my TD3. TD3 is going to start its timing. Instantly it closes over here. This light over here is going to now be turned on over here. Uh, this was going to go start its time. It's going to have a five second timer off of TD number three. And at the end of that, TD three will close and it's going to go fire on my M3 over here. Let me use the wrong color pen. We'll just go to this one here. Fire on my M3. And at that point, my whole system would be running. I'm going to go and have a green light that's going to go and be on over here. 
Um, let's talk about these lights that they have inside of here because right now we have got a bit of an issue off of these lights and the way that they are laid out. There's a, it's a bit of an error that should have been corrected years ago. Once again, it was not corrected. We should have three different colors of lights with three different sequences. We should have one light over here that is going to go and tell us when the system is running. That's going to be this green light over here. We should have another light that's going to tell us when the system is fully stopped. It's going to be the red light. We should have another light that's going to tell us when the system is in the process of starting up. That should be an amber light or a yellow light. It should also have a different control sequence. And we're going to talk about that in a minute here. We're going to come back to this one because this thing is screwed. It's just not the way it's supposed to be. Going back to what we had over here uh, for our operation, we see that now everything is going to be running. If I now press my stop button, pressing the stop button or any of the emergency stops is going to go and drop this rung out over here, which is instantly going to go and shut down my control relay, which is instantly going to drop out all of my motors on this side. Instant shut down on all of my motors and it should shut down my green light, my running light as well. And because each of my motors, because this has gone off, this has gone off, and this has gone off, all of these here should be reclosing, which means that my red light, my stop light should be back on as well. Just goes and, and shuts the whole thing down. Let's go and take this now, and let's just talk about this, this light over here, which is the screwed up light. What we should actually have is that this light should be going across from line one up top over here, going across to line two, or line two to line one, they have it in this case. And it should actually have, it should use the same normally open ones over here, but they should be placed in parallel, is really where the, the issue was. As soon as one of these comes on, as soon as we start into that timing, we should be activating my amber light off of this. This one here should be amber coming out there. It should not be a series operation because right now we would not get this light to activate until after my very last motor has gone and turned on. You know, this just does not make sense that they were going to go and have this thing doing it like that. This should be, like we said, an amber light and it should be parallel contacts. If you would go back through this with this as parallel contacts, and you should be tracing through this circuit a couple times, what you would find is that that would then mean that anytime that we are in the startup sequence, it doesn't matter where we are inside of the startup sequence, but as long as we're inside of the startup sequence, we are going to go and have an amber light warning us that you know there's initiation that is happening inside of here. Okay, one last thing we're going to do with this. Uh, you're going to love it. We are going to go and create a timing diagram because you're smart like that and you should be capable of these types of things. And we're going to go and put in a whole pile of different components inside of here. I'm going to go and put in my stops. I'm just going to call it one, one per stop over here. I'm going to have one per start. I like having both of these in every time diagram because that's what tells me when something goes and starts up and stops. And then I'm going to go and have a bunch of my different outputs. I'm not going to have every single timing uh, relay inside of here because I'm not going to be as concerned with them as I am going to be with the actual outputs. And in a lot of cases, we can associate with them. Well, actually, no, we will put them in there. We're going to go and put in all of these different outputs. So we're going to go and have CR. We are going to go and have TD1. We are going to go and have my HR. We are going to go and have my uh, WH, which is going to be my warning horn. We are going to go and have M1, TD2, M2, and we're going to have a crowded page over here, and TD3 and M3 over here. But it helps us to visualize sequences, you know, when we see these things as a timing relay. We're going to start with my stop being held high, okay? We're going to finish drawing the stop one in there later on, but we're going to start with my my start being brought high. So everything here, at the instant that I start this up, I'm going to go and see that lots of this stuff is going to go and be low. I should also actually make a, another set of lights. I'm just going to move this one down here. I'm running out of room. Oh, man. Start. Stop. And then we are going to go and have red, amber, and green that we are going to go and have for our lights. So we know that when the system is at a stop, that I should have a high off of my stop. And I know that my red should also go and be high. OK, 
Okay, as soon as I go and bring this thing over to a start, so my start starts low, but I activate as soon as I bring the start high. What it is going to do is it is going to go and drop out my my red. Oops, I'm going to draw that one with a, a high line like that. It's going to drop the red out at the same time as it is going to go and take my amber and it's going to go and bring the amber high. So I'm actually just going to draw the dotted line. Just going all the way down here. It doesn't really actually need to go all the way down because a lot of the other stuff doesn't get associated with it right away other than, you know, these ones here. So we'll just stop it right over there. But I see I press the start. When I press the start, my red light is going to go low. I'm going to go and see my amber light that is going to go high at that point. And I'm going to have my green light, which is still going to be low because we're not actually running this thing yet. So I'm going to have a, just a quick little button press. I'm going to take away the back part because we don't really need to worry about that. We know that when we press our start button that we can turn on this one and this one over here, right? CRTAD1, as well as we are going to go and turn on my horn relay because that's going to be sealed in. So I'm just going to start by taking each of those high. CR is going to go high. TD1 is going to go high. We're talking about the signal or the uh, control into it. My horn relay is going to go high because it's being fed through there. And my warning horn as a result is also going to go high. All of this is going to be controlled by this 30 second timer that I'm going to go and have on TD1. So I'm now going to go and draw the TD1 timer as being 30 seconds. And we're going to go and put that one across here. And we're going to go and say that this is where that 30 seconds ends. At the end of that 30 seconds, we're going to go and have a bunch of stuff that is going to go and happen. So we'll carry a dotted line up, we'll carry a dotted line back down over here as well. So here's my timer. My timer is going to go in time. Once I hit that 30 seconds, we're going to have a bunch of stuff that's going to go and change state. But for now, we know that as soon as we provided the start, that's the start now. We don't really care about the start push button, but it turned on my control relay. So we'll carry that one up to there. It turned on my horn relay and it turned on my warning horn. I can see that at the end of the 30 seconds, the horn relay is going to go and shut off. So I'm going to go drop that one down. And if the horn relay shuts off, that's going to go and reopen this, which is going to go and shut off my warning horn. So my warning horn is also going to go and fall at that point. And I'm also going to see that at that point, TD1 over here would go and close in, firing on M1 and TD2. So I'm going to go and have M1 and TD2, which have been low up until now, are then going to go and fire on. They're going to go high like that. Okay. These ones here, warning horn is going to stay low through the duration of the circuit. I'm just going to draw that one out over there. Horn relay is going to go and stay low through the duration of the circuit as well. All of that is going to go and shut off. CR, TD1, those are going to stay high for now. We haven't gone and hit any sort of stops on our system, so we can leave that one alone for the time being. Uh, so we've now turned on M1 and we've turned on TD2. Now TD2 has got a five second delay before it is going to go and do any sort of operation. So I'm just going to put that in there as being five underneath here. I know it's not going to be quite to scale, but it's going to go and have a five second delay. At the end of the five second delay, it is going to go and cause some operation downstream of itself. So we are going to go and carry this one. This one's now going to be operating. This one's going to be operating. My TD1 is still operating. My CR is still operating. So I'm just going to move them all up to that next line that I've drawn because that's the next critical junction. I see that at the end of the five seconds, this one is then going to go and close my TD2 timed contact, which will fire on M2 and TD3. You'll note that I haven't drawn contacts on this side. Really what I'm drawing is just outputs over here. So this is now going to take my M2 from being low, that M2 is now going to go high. And at the same time, my TD3 is going to go from being low, it is going to go high as well. Perfect. So we've got all of this stuff now that is going to be, that one's going to be closed, these ones go high. And I see that as soon as TD3 goes high, it's going to start another five second timer. So we're going to have another five over there. And at the end of that five, we are going to go to another critical juncture. I'm just going to carry this one higher because it's now going to make some differences. Uh, I'm going to go and have had, so the five seconds ended on TD2 over here, which closed in, powered up M2, 
M2 started running, TD3 started running. At the end of the five seconds caused by that, TD3 is going to go and close its contacts and it's going to go and fire on my M3. And so M3, which has been low up until now, is then going to go high and is now going to go and be running over here. <clears throat> Beautiful. This now is going to go and you know, be the extent of my circuit over here. The other thing that happens once I get to M3 running, well, by the time I get to M3 running, all three of these will be closed, which would mean that this green that I'm going to go and have over here would at that point be open. This amber over here would also be running at that point, unless you decided that you wanted to go and run it through a normally closed. You could always redo that amber circuit that we talked about instead of it being um, like, like this, you know, with the three in parallel, you could have TD1 and two in parallel, and then you could series them up with a normally closed from TD3. So that when TD3 went and, you know, finished its operation, uh, series it with a normally closed from M3 would actually be the better one to series them with, that it would go and shut off the light. We haven't drawn that in, so we won't examine it like that. But what we'll see, carrying this line back up to the top over here, is that my red light, it is still off at this point. My amber light has been on. And only now when I actually get to the third motor turning on, does my green light turn on. And at this point, everything would be running. We can go and carry out our running lines for all of these. And we'll carry out those running lines to, well, well, we'll carry them out until we go and stop our system. So I'm gonna just run the stop now. The stop has been high. I'm going to go and take my stop low because until we take a stop low, everything now is going to go and stay at where it's at. The green light would be high, the amber light would be high, uh, meaning that it's gone through the startup and timing, the red light would be low at that point. The start push button doesn't matter, control relay, up until my stop is going to go and be high. I'm just gonna draw this blue dotted line now to represent the stop that's gonna go and happen here. Uh, back into this one over here so my my stop uh, up until the stop runs everything like i said before is going to stay high so i'm just going to carry the rest of these lines out so that we can see what's happening inside of each of these over here so at this point now when we hammer down on the stop when the stop goes low uh what's going to happen is it is going to go and take out all of this stuff right which means that my control relay is going to go down when my control relay goes down it opens these up which means that it is going to go and take out all the rest of this stuff that's going to be downstream from here as well so anything that was previously high motor one goes back down to being low uh, td2 goes back down to being low motor two goes back down to being low td3 goes down to being low M3 goes down to being low here as well. And TD1, uh, when we press the stop, also drop back down to a low value over here. Green light is no longer going to be on because we're not running. Amber light is no longer going to be on because we're not in a startup. The only thing that's going to go high is going to be my red light. And that is a complete timing diagram for this whole system. And it's a bit of a pain to develop, but when you are working inside of these systems, particularly in the sequence and timed control systems like this, it can be super handy when you examine the actual motor outputs. I'm going to go and take a look over here. I'm going to take a look over here, motor two, and I'm going to go and take a look over here. These are the three that I'm really concerned about because those are my actual motor outputs going onto the conveyor. I'm also going to go and take a look at this over here. Uh, as by using my start. So really when I'm reading through these diagrams, I'm going to go and take a read and I'm going to say, bam, I hit a start. Okay, what happens? I'm looking for this operation, this within weights. There's a 30 second delay. I can you know, right away figure out that that 30 second delay has to do with TD1. I'm going to be able to go and read this diagram and say that I see when I hit start, there's a 30 second delay. During that 30 second delay, I see that I've got a warning horn. And then at the end of the warning horn, I'm going to have motor one that's going to turn on. I wait another five seconds. Motor two turns on. I wait another five seconds. Motor three turns on. And I see that all three motors are then going to be running together up until the point where somebody takes my stop from being high, normally closed, back to being low. And then everything is going to shut off from here. All right, lovely. Screenshot that. That is a good timing diagram over there. It's not super neat. I would, you know, draw this thing properly with a computer at this point or in the field with a, you know, proper... Uh, 
Well, with a proper ruler, etc. I'm not going to ask you to draw this one on your exam. I probably will ask you to go and create a timing diagram for me, but I'll probably ask you for something a bunch simpler than this. So that's it. We are through learning task three. Finally, that is the end of the wood chips.